Tonight's presentation, although edited for YouTube, contains imagery and subject matter some may find disturbing. While our program is educational, we still feel that viewer discretion is advised. It is thunderstorming right now as I'm recording this audio, which is a bad omen and a sign of things to come if I've ever heard one. But with that said, when you have a platform like YouTube that's pretty much open to anyone who can make an account, then those people can say mostly whatever they want. It's inevitable that some of those people are just going to be bad or mentally unhinged by pure statistical chance. Don't get me wrong. There are many amazing content creators on this platform that don't do anything horrible, and we've even highlighted some of their work on this channel before. Overall, YouTube's been getting better. The bots have been getting less aggressive, and in recent years, some of the repeat offenders on our list have been defanged monetarily by YouTube itself, which is definitely a step in the right direction. Unfortunately, others continue not only to make content that's generally harmful to the community as a whole, but these content creators most disturbingly exhibit behavior and commit acts that, at least in my own opinion, could lead to an actual body count. And I don't know about you, but I think that's kind of unacceptable. So today, we're gonna do the only thing I really can do about it, and that's talk. YouTube doesn't tend to do anything anyway unless someone starts talking about it wherever, usually on Twitter. So, with that said, we're gonna do this by counting down some of the absolute worst people on YouTube as of 2021, and go through exactly why they're a problem. But before I get into that, I need to pay rent, so introducing today's sponsor, Raid Shadow Legends. For those that don't know, by downloading Raid Shadow Legends to your PC or mobile device, you can explore millions of champion combinations and master countless tactics on the go. Take on raid bosses, dungeon runs, campaign battles, PvP arena matches, or even try your hand at conquering this month's rotation of the Doom Tower. You'll need to summon as many champions as possible if you want to reach the top, but with hundreds of artifacts to equip and over 500 champions of unique skills, you can build your team, develop your champions, and in a way, raid your own way. Maybe you've been having difficulties battling the Fire Knight, Fyro the Infamous, due to his shield's ability to protect him from damage and debuffs. Here's where you may need to adapt your team strategy, since champions who hit multiple times of each attack like Apothecary and Coldheart will have an easier time removing the shields quickly, allowing you to deliver some damage. The Fire Knight is just one of many bosses who test your ability to switch up your strategy and team's composition, making it key to as mass as many champions as possible and keep an open mind when building your roster. Raid is adding new things all the time, like a bunch of new champions this month and the aforementioned rotation on the Doom Tower. So, if you want to get a huge head start in Raid today and conquer that Doom Tower that I mentioned before, all you have to do is hit the link in the description or scan the QR code right here. New players will get an epic hero, Chanoru, who's specifically made to help with the new Doom Tower rotation. 200k silver, 1 XP boost, 1 energy refill, and 1 ancient shard that will allow you to summon your awesome champion as soon as you get in game. You'll find your extra rewards here in the inbox for the next 30 days only. Thank you Raid Shadow Legends for not only making this video possible, but also helping me pay the editors, writers, and other people who made this thing possible as well as my rent. So with that said, sit back, relax, turn off the light, and prepare to be scared. These are 9 of the worst YouTubers that need to stop. Volume 2. As repeat offenders and our list of worst YouTubers, you probably already heard a hefty chunk of the controversy following the former Vine and Disney Channel stars Logan and Jake Paul without even seeking it out. You've already heard about the Japanese Suicide Force vlog disaster in the wake of other horribly disrespectful videos in Italy, where in which the brothers were arrested for illegally flying a drone over the Roman Colosseum? In fact, the only thing the Paul brothers seem to respect less than the foreign ventures they exploit for content are the fans who live there. Like this viewer from Kazakhstan, whom Jake insinuates to be a terrorist, mainly due to his lack of understanding of things outside the US. 
Of course, you've already heard about the Dead Rat video, which we can all agree is at the very least in poor taste, and in which landed Logan in hot water with YouTube. However, one can argue that above all this, the worst thing to come out of the channel are the music videos, which range from being generally difficult to listen to, or just making you want to gouge your ears out, in the fear you might hear another one again. But keep the music videos in mind for later. They've abused fans, girlfriends, and neighbors alike, exploiting these relationships before using and discarding their victims if a sense of detachment that makes the Paul brothers uniquely hateable. As a result, their exploits and controversies, of which there's enough to talk about for hours on end, have already been covered in great length. Instead, we want to focus on something especially dangerous which has been going on for the past year and a half. First of all, it needs to be stated that the Paul brothers live in quite excessive wealth, due in no small part to the aggressive product placement and manipulation of the young viewers, both of the Paul brothers push enough merchandise to live in the lap of luxury forever. In the Calabanza's mansion, built in the back of millions of parents' credit cards, Jake Paul shoots his aforementioned mediocre music videos. These video shoots have led to gatherings in so much excess that actually raised complaints from local officials, and even gaining the attention of the city mayor? But it is here where the video needs to be paused for a second, only to make sure that everyone's on the same page. In this past year, we've all had to uniquely struggle and cope with something unprecedented in the 21st century. While we can't exactly mention what that thing is due to possible demonetization, you can probably understand why seeing these gatherings in 2020 and 2021 are quite dangerous, and potentially even deadly in these unprecedented times. Not only were these crowded gatherings a nuisance to neighbors, no one wearing a mask or even social distancing, and when this was criticized by the Daily Beast for his callous behavior, Jake Paul called this whole thing we're going through a hoax within the interview. This is the note, of course, that he did retract his claims a bit later, even supposedly apologizing to Kawabasa's mayor. This could just be a disingenuous attempt to damage control, considering the fact that Jake would go on to throw another raging after-party following his boxing bout with Nate Robinson, and another one after his fight with Ben Askren. I'd say it's one thing to celebrate at home whether or not you won a boxing match, but when that celebration could potentially kill someone's immunocompromised grandma, that is just one of the reasons why the Paul brothers need to be stopped in 2020. What, you think I was going to fight him? How am I supposed to win against someone who has a chain of Charizard? That's impossible. We all know that one person who just wants to watch the world burn. It can be fun to cause a little bit of lighthearted grief online, but for Swedish YouTuber Maximilian Muss, his identity and self-worth are attached to the chaos he causes. Desperate for relevance and notoriety, Maximilian revels in the negative attention he receives for crossing the line, which has resulted in a feedback loop where his stunts continue to be as deprived and outright nasty as possible. At the moment, however, things may have become a little too hot in the kitchen, since Max has deactivated his YouTube channel for the second time in the past three months in an attempt to mitigate how many people are physically able to unsubscribe from his channel in the wake of these controversies, the word desperate comes to mind again. From the beginning of his channel, Maximilian had little to offer to the YouTube platform. His content mainly consisted of trolling videos featuring games like Overwatch and Fortnite where he could reliably bait reactions from children. It was Maximilian's behavior in these videos that would cause him to be relentlessly banned from Overwatch by Blizzard Entertainment. Again, it can be fun to cause a bit of grief, but but simply recording yourself ruining a game for someone does not good content make. This would eventually culminate in a music video titled Oh Yeah Yeah, using a common phrase from Maximilian's videos and remixing it to a parody of the German band trio's Da Da Da. While the video itself is obnoxious and unfunny on its own, the phrase Oh Yeah Yeah would become a meme among Maximilian's followers, who were all encouraged to change their profile picture to JC Denton from Deus Ex and spam comment the phrase all over the website. Of course, all of this so far is arguably just edgy fun, and nobody's gotten hurt yet. While his infamous YouTube takeover was an irritating footnote for most, Maximilian had gotten his first taste of the power he could wield over his audience. The power dynamic would only become more skewed and exploited in Max's Discord communities after the oh yeah yeah meme had done the legwork of gathering him some attention. In the autumn of 2019, Maximilian found that he could use his Discord community to raid various streamers, weaponizing his fans to spam hateful messages, and vitriol while impersonating fellow content creator Weast. He did this by 
by flooding his Discord with links to various streamers, instructing his loyal 13-year-old army to go to this live stream and type Weast Raid, Weast Gang, and say homophobic stuff and spam and be racist and sexist and mean. Truly, this man is nothing short of a rocket scientist. Nevertheless, these raids were a nuisance and even resulted in the ban of a few streamers, forcing Weast to apologize and explain the situation. In the midst of this controversy, Maximilian admitted in an interview that he would do it again, and merely saw an opportunity to bully Weast's girlfriend, since her father had recently passed away. So candid was the weaponization of Maximilian's audience that he would regularly make casual remarks about sending his fans to kill other YouTubers like Turkey Tom, Critical, and Blues Dank. Even more disturbing than the galvanization of his followers is the way Maximilian has manipulated people outside of his servers. In one such case, Maximilian bullied autistic YouTuber JMAATV into eating his own feces and using that feces to write on his chest in a Discord call which he recorded. Belittling and egging him on, Maximilian convinced JMAA TV that he would gain followers if he humiliated himself for Maximilian's amusement. If JMAA hadn't come forward about this abuse, Maximilian would have likely taken it further, since he also had plans to make the autistic man cut off his own fingers. It seems that whether it's children or the mentally handicapped, Maximilian naturally gravitates towards people he feels he can hold power over. The disturbing trend of pressuring people to humiliate and violate themselves in online videos becomes even darker when you consider Maximilian's secret weapon, a Discord user named Balabong. First, the setup. Maximilian will try to trick someone that he doesn't like into joining a private Discord call, either by sending direct messages claiming he wants to collaborate, or by goading them into public forums. Once they join the call, Maximilian presses record, and Balabong will proceed to assail the victim's eyes by exposing himself, inserting objects into his rectum, and abusing his own genitals. All while this is happening, Maximilian and the other followers he invited to the call share a laugh while gloating and taunting their victim. This setup was repeatedly used to harass Lieutenant Cobra, who was only 15 at the time, and describes the twisted things Balabong did to his own body during the call in a tell-all video. Of course, these wouldn't be the last allegations regarding Maximilian's suspicious behavior towards minors. Maximilian has already been known to joke about pedophilia in his Fortnite videos and Discord server, suggesting that CP isn't as bad as people make it out to be, and insinuating that he himself is a pedophile. While on their own, these jokes are creepy at best, they take a more sinister undertone in the context of the criticism Maximilian has had levied against him for propositioning underage girls for nude photos, and the laissez-faire approach he has taken to moderating the CP which is posted for sick laughs on his own Discord servers. While it's unlikely that Maximilian is a genuine pedophile, or would ever hurt a child in real life, it's apparent that he fails to recognize the gravity of the issues of pedophilia, making light of it instead, in order to further instigate people. The Maximilian Must Rabbit Hole is a quagmire of depravity which sinks lower and lower as you sift through the mud and blurred lines. A disturbing reminder of what can happen if an influencer engages with their audience in an irresponsible way. Abusing the people around him in order to push people until they break is why Maximilian Muss needs to be stopped. Starting their channel seriously in 2017, The Non Sequitur Show was an atheist livestream channel that focused on giving a platform for debate. For example, their most notable video involves Aaron Ra debating professional crazy person Ken Hoven, who's known for being a young earth creationist and promoting cyanide as a cure for cancer. The debates were enjoyable and curated by the founders of the channel, that being Steve McRae, a Navy veteran who handled debate arrangement and moderation. Kyle Curtis, who was a friend of C's at the time and a graphical artist who could do the artsy stuff, and the late Bullinator, who managed the technical aspects of the streamed events. Together, they built an audience of roughly 33,000 followers, a Patreon which at its peak pulled in $1,000 a month, and thousands of more dollars through direct donations and YouTube super chats. Despite having a small audience, these people were seriously dedicated, and their channel pulled in a decent chunk of money, more than enough than a person a two could live on, which is why we're bringing this up, because the only person to ever see those funds would be Kyle Curtis. Early on in the channel's existence, Steve McRae gave Kyle full access to the channel because Kyle claimed that he needed it for SEO reasons, which later turned out to be a lie. When Patreon started to pick up and the channel started to see some serious cash flow from Super Chats and donators, Steve began to wonder when he actually would get paid. Whenever he asked Kyle about the payment, Kyle always had some sort of excuse. Whether it was, I'll pay you at the end of the tax year for 
tax reasons, or whatever, Kyle always seemed to have a reason why he couldn't show Steve McRae the books. As Steve pressured Kyle, Kyle slowly started to lessen Steve's influence on the channel, which includes making spin-off shows without his inclusion or input, and not inviting him to the official non sequitur show streams. This all came to a boiling point in June 11th, 2019, when Kyle dropped the facade and removed Steve entirely from the YouTube channel that Steve had created in the first place. Red Rhetoric, a friend of Steve's, was set to do a debate that night, but refused to do the advertised event unless Steve was present, which forced a tense call between Bullinator, Steve, and Red, and eventually Kyle Curtis. Kyle would go on to claim in this call that he had every right to remove Steve because he had the audacity to correct one of his own patrons from a separate project outside of the non sequitur show, setting the precedent that whoever donates the most money to any individual person can choose who can and cannot speak on their debate channel. Obviously, this created friction between the three creators. Red's intention for that call was to hopefully pressure Kyle into taking a step back so that the show could go on as planned for that night. Red knew that Kyle was trying to cut Steve out and as a result took a stand and demanded that he be included. Kyle, on the other hand, had other plans. You see, Kyle has already been pulling from the Super Chats, Patreon, and merch sales to not only pay for his living expenses, but also conventions and trips to his boyfriends. And trust me, we'll get onto that boyfriend topic later. After doing some of my own napkin math and looking over some of the legal proceedings, it's likely that at this point, Kyle did not have the funds to pay Steve back, which would explain why I wouldn't show the books to Steve or give him his due. Instead, Kyle's excuse was that he had done more work and that he was the non sequitur show and narcissistically ended the call with the infamous line, sue me. Afterwards, he would completely remove Bulinator from the channel as well. What's happening? He changed the VMix thing, didn't he? Uh, no, he didn't what? change the VMix thing. The, the what? But I don't have access to the non sequitur show anymore. Well, there you go. Well, there you go. Yeah, so um, I think Kyle's going the route that he wants to go. Um, so, after being requested to be sued, Steve did. Enter Player 3, who just happened to be Steve's personal friend and Flat Earth debunker, as well as an Australian multimillionaire, Rue Hiff. Being blessed with seemingly bottomless legal funding in 2019, the battle for the non sequitur show would continue to move forward, this time in the courts. This did not stop Kyle, however, from trying to hinder the case every chance he had. Throughout the entire court proceedings, Kyle actually only showed up once for the deposition, where he lied to his lawyer and was also explained what would happen if he he tried to falsify evidence. Don't worry, he falsified evidence anyway. Despite being asked multiple times by a judge, Kyle's excuse for dodging the court boiled down to him claiming that he moved and was never properly served. He was able to show this by forging several documents, including bank statements and his boyfriend's signature to make it look like he wasn't living with his own mother. My name is Benjamin Potts, and my loser ex-boyfriend, Kyle Curtis, forged my name on fake documents that he created behind my back. He is a mentally unstable psychopath, and I don't say that lightly. I just wish I would have known it sooner. While we can't show addresses, we can show other silly mistakes, like him forgetting to add the year on one of the statements and the universal barcode on the bank statement still leading to his mom's zip code. After successfully crowdfunding a lawyer, that lawyer promptly withdrew the case, citing dishonest behavior from Kyle, who went on to represent himself. Since Kyle had no intention on showing up the court ever, the case went into default judgment, which awarded the non sequitur show and all of its assets, as well as its financial information, to Steve McRae. Kyle wrote the judge back saying no, and instead that he would retain 50% ownership of the channel, and that he was going to delete Twitter to basically cover up evidence. The judge, as you can imagine, was not amused, and a contempt hearing will likely conclude after the publication of this video. In conclusion, the non sequitur show died in 2019 a channel which once raked in thousands of dollars, both in goodwill from its devout audience and actual money is now sitting at about one Patreon subscriber and a declining subscriber base. Kyle actually did upload to the channel while the legal proceedings were underway and he had already received a cease and desist. He did so with the popular YouTube skeptic, Mr. Atheist, who also knew about this hijacking and despite all the evidence of deception, chose to side with Kyle anyway. I'm not sure why anyone with that kind of audience would do that, but sure, good on you, buddy. 
To this day, people still harass Steve over this situation, and even though Steve has been awarded the channel, Kyle seems to be willing to take that channel credentials to prison and possibly his grave, just to spite Steve. And as we all know, even with a court putting it into writing, YouTube is still unwilling to help Steve get his channel back. So Kyle, if you happen to be watching this and you're not currently in prison, I only have one thing to request from you. Please, just give Steve his channel back and do yourself a favor and... Think about this. Listen, you got at least three-fourths of your life to go. That's three more lifetimes to you. So don't blow it. Stop it. Get some help. Sometimes when you found out you made a mistake, it may be tempting to push the situation under the rug, as of course carrying on as if nothing happened is a lot easier than taking accountability after all. But in reality, intent to cover up injustice or wrongdoings is sometimes more sinister than negligence. For example, Doug Walker, also known as a nostalgia critic, chronically covered up misconduct on his YouTube brand and website Channel Awesome, even going as far as to bully content creators he employed to keep them quiet and in line. This was all to keep up appearances, but when you harbor abusers and keep them out of public eye, this only allows for their acts of abuse to be perpetrated. Channel Awesome, which would later be the name of Doug's YouTube channel, began as an alternative to YouTube. The site was hosted by Blip TV and offered a space for content creators as well as movie reviewers with a similar style of Doug in order to monetize their views. The creators hosted by Channel Awesome apparently weren't under any contract, which would present problems later down the line but at the time seemed very accommodating given the difficulty achieving partner status on early YouTube. However, viewers would begin to see the workplace toxicity of Channel Awesome as it was bullying over into crossover specials, which were films produced in-house and featured the site's contributors acting in character as their Channel Awesome personas. Issues with the production of the films are glaring, including injuries on set, actors overheating, and especially long filming hours. Contracts were drafted to prevent litigation against Channel Awesome for the poor conditions, and in such cases where injury occurred before a contract was signed, actors were coerced into giving their signatures so that Channel Awesome wouldn't be liable. Not only were actors mistreated, sacrificing their time and risking bodily harm to appear in these crossover specials, but they weren't even paid to do so. In fact, a considerable number of the crew involved with the fourth film to boldly flee, swore off working with Doug entirely after the project. Not only was the script itself problematic for suggesting that many of the site's contributors would be let go after the film was released, but also for making light of sexual assault within a scene involving Linkara and Lindsay Ellis' characters, which must have been excruciatingly degrading for both of these people. The root of the issue of Channel Awesome was that none of the site's contributors were under any form of contract. Instead, creators were paid through ads on their own videos and benefited the website by bringing in viewers. This left little way in terms of protection for the site's employees, who were bullied and made to feel replaceable since they could be let go at any time for any reason. This stifled the ability of the site's contributors to criticize Channel Awesome in any meaningful way and kept their workspace toxicity under wraps for years. One contributor, Askiris Lupa, was even let go and scrubbed from the website within hours, all because she failed to answer Greg Walker's summons to a Skype call that had a 15 minute window to answer. Obscurus is understandably bewildered in these screenshots, considering of course she just lost her livelihood and platform on Channel Awesome, all because she was away from her PC for 15 minutes. Of course in the spring of 2018, Channel Awesome would suffer from this decision. It was thanks to the efforts of Lupa and other Channel Awesome contributors like Linkara, Mars Girl, and that dude in the sway that the floodgates of unanswered misconduct could finally be opened. Not So Awesome is a 70 page document written by Channel Awesome's contributors and the site's ex-HR manager, Holly Brown. It is a record of events including statements from over 20 ex-producers and staff members of Channel Awesome, which go into detail the site's gross mismanagement and complacency in the face of abuse and sexual misconduct towards the employees. The document was posted to Twitter and chiefly features abuse carried out by the website's co-founder, Mike Ellis, and its CEO, Mike Michaud. Michaud came to be known as the silent CEO of Channel Awesome, since he doesn't do much aside from bully the website's contributors into silence and capsulation. He's described in the document as unprofessional, aggressive, immature, difficult to work with, and 
and misogynistic. Not only was Michaud especially dismissive to the concerns of female contributors to the site, but he also owns the exclusive rights to the Nostalgia Critic and remains affiliated with the company to this day. Meanwhile, co-founder Mike Ellis was a creep who harassed the aforementioned Holly Brown for refusing to enter a relationship and sent inappropriate messages to the creator of Epic Fail, describing the things he wanted to do to Sean's body and calling him his sexual cupcake. Not only was Mike Ellis kept on the payroll for over a year after the harassment was reported, but when he was finally let go, contributors to Channel Awesome were so concerned for Holly's safety that she was temporarily interned in a private safe house in case Mike Ellis sought revenge. This trend of ignoring sexual misconduct would only continue when one of the darkest stories brought to light thanks to the document as seen on page 66. An anonymous contributor who was 18 at the time shared her story in the Not So Awesome document with her identity protected by the moniker Jane Doe. This anonymous contributor claimed that she had been groomed by a former producer who used his power and status as a content creator to manipulate the young woman into taking her clothes off. While Jane Doe didn't disclose the identity of the producer herself, she claimed that the site's management had been aware of the misconduct for over a year, yet had done nothing at all. Channel Awesome responded to the document for the second time in a post on their website, which also tried to refute the claims made on page 66 of the document. In screenshots by Channel Awesome to prove that the abuser had been fired, identifying information was obscured on the documents which pertained to this termination. Left in the censored documents, however, was the date of termination and the first initial of the abuser, J. Later on Reddit, a second accuser came forward to name Justin Carmichael as a perpetrator, finally giving us the full story. The second victim had repeatedly turned down Justin's unwanted sexual advances at the 2013 MAGFest, where the assault would occur. Later, after having too much to drink, she would pass out in the middle of the floor of a hotel room. When she awoke, Justin was lying naked beside her, touching her genitals. It was then that the second victim got in contact with Holly Brown, who would later verify the Reddit posts made by the alleged second victim. The act of sexual assault prompted no action from Doug Wonker, nor the management, and Channel Awesome. The number of women who were harmed by Justin's predatory behavior is still unknown to this day. One year after the MAGFest incident, Justin Carmichael would proceed to commit suicide, meaning that evidence of his sexual misconduct would only surface posthumously. When the victims did share the stories, they cited being terrified of backlash as their reason to not come forward sooner. This is due largely in part once again to Doug Walker, who created a tribute video after Justin's death, which would lead the change to paint him as a well-meaning person who would never be capable of harming anyone, let alone sexual assault. News of Justin's death and a celebration of the facade Doug Walker had created proliferated online, thus causing a rift between the person Justin was and the way he was perceived. These victims feared backlash for coming forward because of the reverence Justin received in death thanks to the way Doug aggressively pushed his narrative. In other words, the way in which Doug Wonger deliberately covered up sexual assault committed by a Channel Awesome producer led to justice being stifled for the affected parties for years. According to Obscurus Lupa, Doug Wonker is rebranding his company to focus on the nostalgia critic alone. All but a few of the contributors to Channel Awesome remain, but Doug Wonker still hasn't been held accountable for the cases of abuse and misconduct that he covered up for years to protect his brand. For everything we have mentioned up until this point, there is still a litany of allegations which have gone unanswered in the Not So Awesome document, which would take hours upon hours to cover in their entirety. Considering that his view counts are as strong as ever in spite of the mountain of evidence, the only thing we can try and do is to be more critical of the content we consume, hoping one day that justice can be served. Hey, sorry to interrupt the video now, but one of the comments I get all the time is, Hey, Creepy, where do you get the music that you use and where can I listen to it? The answer to that is, if you check in the links in the description below, you will find a producer that helps me make all the music for the channel. But also, a lot of the tracks on the channel were custom made specifically for this purpose. So, as a result, we have decided to release every song that was custom made for the That Creepy Reading channel on Bandcamp for $5 or more. If you already enjoy the content that we make, and you enjoy the music that I use, and are interested in supporting us in some way to make more, well, there you go. Also, if you happen to be a Patreon subscriber at any point during this video, just send me a message. Even if you've only donated $1, I will be giving you specifically a link to the track for free. And the track will be free for any Patreon subscribers. The album's called Empathy, it has 25 tracks, and if any of the stuff that's in the background sounds interesting to you, go check it out. And also, don't forget to check out the music producer's channel, linked down below. Alright, with that said, back to the video.
Cosmodor is, or rather was, a popular German cartoon reviewer known for his multiple SpongeBob ranking videos and general interest in colorful children's media, having many visible connections in the YouTube scene at his disposal. This would lead to cameos on much larger channels such as Did You Know Gaming, Spockter, and Ellis Mark, and he was generally well regarded as a fun, carefree guy that most could get along with. Those connections, however, would all come to a screeching halt after an old secret of his was revealed to the public for the first time by none other than the man himself. If you want the most simple answer for why someone on this list is terrible, how about just a few ages for when this adult creator started dating an anonymous user? 19 to 15. In December of 2019, for the first time, Cosmo admitted to having been seeing a 15-year-old from America. And while he may have admitted that to an extent, it was only the beginning of learning just how downright abusive the relationship truly was. Cosmo alludes multiple times in the initial tweet and subsequent replies below that he didn't see the face of the child while they dated, nor did he initially know their age, and yeah, both of these would go on to be proven false. A while after this original tweet Cosmo would then go on to delete, he stated he needed to take a break before going further into the relationship in a community post and YouTube stories which are now lost to time. From what can be gleaned, the two instances were both guilt-ridden and still full of lies to remain seemingly innocent in some way, being dismantled later on in Daft Pina's video about the situation. By getting in contact with the victims, Daft was able to not only show how the situation was worse than first stated, but he also showed new evidence indicating that Cosmo had sent NSFW, or pornographic material, to the minor during texts and planned to meet up with them at Momocon before cancelling. Cosmo would also go on to meet the popular YouTuber Ellis Mark when he was underaged at a concert. Taking the initiative when he booked the hotel room, Cosmo made sure to get a single bed for the two despite most hotels having similar pricing for two bedrooms. And in a now-deleted non-apology video, Cosmo would go on to pretend there is no bad blood between him and Ellis Mark, and in private to that creepy reading, tried to downplay his intentions. Yeah, you, the part of the video where you talk about Ellis Mark really, like, kind of sticks out to me. Is, is there, like, something that happened that might, like, lead people to believe that you were grooming him? Or... The, o the only thing I could imagine, but this, is, this isn't even public knowledge, I don't think he even told anyone is we we met up at a concert once there's pictures of it like people knew that this was going on this isn't a secret or anything um but like yeah nothing happened there we kind of just awkwardly sat next to each other in a hotel room in the middle of nowhere uh i was very close to including that part in the video because like it, it can look incriminating i realized that but after talking with Ellis Mark, nothing ultimately happened due to an awkward atmosphere, but it's clear that Cosmo's intent was less than pure. Speculation can be put up as to whether or not Cosmo intended to do unspeakable acts with the minor while interacting with them, but when it comes to the porn that was sent, that's actually illegal under German law in relation to illicit imagery sent from an adult to an adolescent. Not to mention there is a pattern. Of course, Cosmo also turned out to be a person that actively toyed with the emotions of Anon, making them wait for long periods of time to get them to worry or other various forms of mental manipulation. Really, par for the course at this point for not just grooming, but general abusive relationships overall. His initial victim would go on to make a video, which for privacy reasons we won't show here. In this video, however, we can confirm that she proves Cosmo knew of her age, sent illicit material despite that, and gravitated towards this individual despite the fact that they sound very much like a young child. Cosmo has two main responses after this, and both are equally disgusting for entirely different reasons. During his first response, right after Daft Pina's original video release, Cosmo explained in a black video his story with the minor, describing them as talented and unlike anyone he'd known before. The overall atmosphere of the response was incredibly creepy considering he was describing the minor he not only dated but was emotionally abusive with and sent lewd imagery to. A few commentators made responses to it, disgusted at what was said, but for the most part it went unnoticed until much later on, after a few failed attempts at returning to his review making where he did a follow-up response. Briefly breaking the fourth wall, hi, I'm just stopped, I did a response to this specific video a while back dissecting it inside and out, which is more detailed than what will be found here. This response was somehow able to come off even creepier than Cosmo's last by having a key factor in there of subtle arrogance. Cosmo knew at this point, thanks to just how much of a pain international cases can be for grooming and how little people could do about it, that he had basically gotten away with this terrible act he committed, so upon seeing his return not so well received, he decided to bitch, denying having done 
done anything completely morally illegally wrong, acting as though what he did was nothing more than a cultural thing, something that can objectively be proven false even by German laws as mentioned previously. Beyond that, if it wasn't pathetic enough already, Cosmo tried to play the role of the victim at some point by acting as though the people calling him out were enacting nothing less than cancel culture. Unfortunately, that's not where the crazy train ends, nor where it reaches its height of degeneracy. After continuing to soldier on with uploads of increasingly negative reception following his second, somehow worse response to everything, Cosmo had another community post to make. This time, he had gone as far as to sexually interact with another underage user. We don't have clear confirmation of their age, but considering this is coming straight from the horse's mouth after all the drama he went through trying to say what he did with Anon was okay, all that can be said at this point is the fact that Cosmo still isn't in prison. Prosecuting these kinds of cases, especially internationally, is difficult given our current laws and tools, so it's unknown if he will ever face any kind of consequences for his behavior. There is so much more that we could go through too, which might warrant its own entire video in the future, but for now, hopefully you can't deny it makes him worthy of a place on this list. Even though it's likely that Cosmo will continue slithering back to YouTube. I mean, he's already tried going back while trying to make this video, and basically stated that his intent seems to be coming back at some point. Whereas in a perfect world, he would just be gone for good. If you're hearing this, Cosmo, you've done enough. By the way, this is creepy with a quick addendum here. I just wasn't going to even include this information until Cosmodor recently released a video where he announced basically that at least at some point he plans on coming back. So in light of that recent information, I would like to let you guys know that I actually interviewed Cosmodor as you saw earlier in the video. The a point of that interview, at least in my own mind, was to maybe convince him if, like, I couldn't get him in jail to get him to stop hanging out with minors, which is why when he ended up remaking his Discord, he announced that it was 18 plus only, all an attempt to get my trust and sympathy, only to start mocking the idea of grooming when I didn't immediately catch on to that. While his Twitter is currently deleted, I did happen to save this screenshot where he's basically just mocking the idea of grooming altogether, and apparently I was the only one to reach out to this guy to get him to stop hurting kids. Check out this clip from Stuff with Scoutfly. And he does exactly what he was doing before. He just goes online and then he just f continues to f apologize for this and that and everything else. And you know what he goes and he says, this is for me. This is just for me. Of course it's for you, you stupid f You know why it's just for you? Because you have no sympathy for the person that you cause all these f problems for. So you're here doing this shit again after I sat on the fucking phone with you for three hours eight months ago, you fucking moron. Three hours I sat on the phone with you and he sits there and he gives me this sob story. And you know what? I didn't buy it, but the thing is people slip, they fall down, they make mistakes. Some mistakes bigger than others. And what I was trying to tell this kid was that you need to go away. You need to get help before you think about coming back to your fan base, your <clears throat> fledgling young audience. Cosmodor made a mistake once and then he repeated that mistake again and then again, even after multiple content creators tried to reach out to him and get him some help. Cosmodor is nothing but a lying, manipulative abuser, and I don't think he has any intention on changing that. And honestly, that's why my piss has come to a boil when I heard that he plans on coming back to hurt even more people. Just something to think about. This person is not only one of the worst YouTubers I've heard about in recent years, but someone who genuinely scares me a little bit as they tend to target other content creators, and that's if you happen to be her friend. By making this video, I could be very well painting a target on myself, but I I'm not one to bow down or capitulate to threats. So with that out of the way, Creepshow Art began her YouTube channel in 2016. However, all videos before 2018 have been deleted. The deletion of incriminating videos will be a reoccurring theme for her channel. Her content consists of mostly rants or racially charged dramatic takes on current drama, whether it be easy targets like Anision, other artists and commentators, or really anybody she doesn't or even does like. 
Remember the non sequitur show situation I mentioned near the beginning of this video and how people I've been harassing Steve ever since? Well, creep show art happened to be one of the people involved with that. It seems that no matter where you look into creep show or Shannon, if they were involved, there would be manufactured drama to fuel content for her channel. Among the drama videos, Shannon also made sketchbook storytime videos, a style of content made popular by Emily Artful several years back. These videos also received criticism for being far-fetched and containing contradictory or exaggerated details, which made the stories hard to believe, at least in the original way that she presented them. For example, Shannon often talked about how hard it was to be homeless under the pretense that she was going through a hard time, just barely scraping by, a story that we've heard all too often and something that immediately pulls at the heartstrings. Hearing about someone else in that kind of trouble, especially someone that you look up to, makes you immediately want to help them out, because hearing about human suffering absolutely sucks. But then it was later revealed that she and her husband Anthony had been planning on living in a van for a while. Think hashtag van life instead of just got evicted, which was what was originally presented to her audience. So in this video, I wanted to go over what it was like to be homeless or kind of partially be homeless living out of a car for about two and a half, three years or so. And keep in mind, this was a conscious decision to do this. We didn't get evicted and thrown out on the street or something like that. We planned for this for about six months to about a year or so. In various videos, interviews, and story times, Creepshow talked about the quirks they had to get used to while on the road, like how she used to have to use the internet at Starbucks or at public buildings like the Tiggard Public Library in Oregon. This detail will become relevant later. What Shannon would not put in these videos, however, is what she used the internet for. Shannon spent a lot of time using the website lolcow.farm. Whether it was to say mean things about her own channel, or to direct drama at other content creators like the aforementioned Emily Artful, or D'Angelo Wallace and Hopeless Peaches, Shannon had no problem using the anonymous website to talk about other creators that she didn't like for the sole purpose of hurting them. Shannon would even go as far as doxing her own sibling through this site. Though, I hope you understand that we can't show that particular receipt here. The funny thing is, is that we only know about Shannon's activity on lolcow.farm because lolcow.farm has a strict rule about not throwing shade on yourself to generate attention, or using the website to specifically direct hate at people you yourself are beefing with. When Shannon broke this rule, the admins leaked her IP, which again, we can't show here, but it seems to track along with places that she lived at or visited. Shannon had made hundreds of awful, mean, degrading posts towards other content creators under an anonymous guise. If that wasn't enough, Creepshow had tried to defend herself by claiming that the post had been made by an anonymous secret stalker, which was previously mentioned in her video, I was stalked for 8 plus years story time. The crux of the argument can be boiled down to this. A girl, codenamed Amy, Creepshow for some reason won't release her real name, used to stalk Shannon for the aforementioned 8 plus years, doxing her family, spoofing her IP, and generally causing harm by both attacking her channel and paradoxically supporting it in other ways, all while pretending to be her online. Smelling something fishy, I reached out to the YouTube creator Mudahar, or Some Ordinary Gamers, as well as a few other creators that happen to know far more about IP spoofing than I do. The consensus that I've gotten from multiple different sources is IP spoofing is just something that does not happen like this in 2021. It's possible, but extremely improbable for the purposes being alleged here. With the systems we have in place, IP spoofing a specific target in the way that Shannon described for 8 plus years consistently without fail just doesn't happen. That, coupled with the fact that this mysterious third party has no evidence for existing other than Shannon's highly dubious word, means that, at least in my opinion, we can easily dismiss this defense. Unlike Creepshow, however, someone did have a stalker for eight years, and her name was Emily Artful. For the last eight years, Emily has been harassed and tormented by an online predator. This individual managed to get access to Emily's old Facebook accounts which she had owned and operated since she was a minor. 
This account contained everything from compromising photos, some of which were when Emily was underage, to teenage bad takes that would be deleted under any other circumstance. The stalker managed to get Emily fired from her job by pretending to be an angry client that saw the compromising video of Emily on her social media. This all happened shortly after she broke up with her boyfriend at the time, Anthony, also known as Creepshow's current husband. In Emily Artful's video, Creepshow Art has always been this way, she alleges that under the influence of drugs and while she was barely coherent, Anthony also took advantage of her. Emily also calls their past relationship toxic because Anthony is scary and has very possessive behavior. This continued on even after the relationship ended and Emily started her now successful YouTube channel. In that video, she also talks about this one time when she got really happy that she broke 100k views on one of her videos and it's something that made her happy and excited. And she celebrated this by tweeting out that one of her projects went mini viral. That's when Anthony decided to go on and accuse her of viewbotting while generally being antagonistic and douchey. Less than a minute later, a sock puppet account on Twitter would also send DMs to Emily accusing her of viewbotting. While at first, Emily employed a block and ignore mentality to dealing with this harassment, and as a result, didn't screenshot much of the early story. Eventually, she would go on to prove that it was Shannon, at least in our own opinion. One of the things Emily's stalker liked to do was harass Emily on Snapchat, sometimes pretending to be an obsessed, underage fan that discovered her home address with extremely threatening undertones. Emily, however, managed to bait several of these creepy stalker accounts, allegedly made by Shannon and Anthony, into clicking a Grabify link, which, of course, came back with Shannon's home IP, and on several occasions, the IP address of the Tiggard Public Library in Oregon. So I would go every day to a Starbucks or to the Tiger Public Library, and I would sit and I would just draw for hours trying to like get one video done. After hearing this interview, I immediately DM'd Emily to confirm this because I did remember her mentioning Oregon in one of the times that she tricked him into clicking the IP tracking link. So isn't it weird that Emily was getting harassed by someone at a public library in Tigard, Oregon, and here Creepshow is admitting to using the same library? It's not a coincidence at all. There is no longer room for skepticism anymore or to even deny that this is true at this point. She name dropped Emily, she talked about being homeless, and name dropped the library that she was at. I mean, what are the odds here that Creepshow is married to Emily's ex-boyfriend and using the same library that Emily traced the IP address from? For eight years, Shannon and Anthony tormented Emily for no other reason than they could. And while that's technically allegedly, I personally believe that to be true. Just from the little cow post alone, which we know Shannon made, we can see that she even went as far as targeting Emily's children. Creepshow has tried in many laughable ways to spin a narrative that would put blame on some unknown third party that won't ever reveal themselves. But at least in my opinion, that's not a good defense and it's not a good look. Day by day, more and more evidence piles up, and I have to keep rewriting the script to include that evidence. For example, Shannon's ex-friends have come forward to confirm that they saw Shannon stalking Emily on her computer when they met in real life. Creepshow's own sibling basically confirmed that she saw what she was doing and found the behavior to be disturbing and tried to get her to stop. And they found Anthony to be, at least in their opinion, incredibly abusive to Shannon. If you find yourself in this situation, document and save everything. Because sometimes blocking and ignoring people that are this persistent just doesn't work. My heart goes out to you, Emily. For you to have survived this level of continued harassment must have taken a lot of deep inner strength and I have nothing but admiration for that. And I appreciate you coming forward with all the receipts and evidence that you could. I've seen people get harassed like this before and in my experience, often for the victim, it ends badly. Our current legal system isn't currently equipped to deal with this. Methods of fighting cyber crimes like this are either woefully underdeveloped or the current police are unwilling to really do anything about it. And as a result, it can sometimes be hard to prove who the real stalker is and also make it extremely difficult to get any sort of legal resolution. This is nothing short 
of a nightmare scenario. And that is why Creepshow is on this list as perhaps one of the worst YouTubers on the history of the platform. At least, currently she is. We'll figure that out next year. This will be the last time we cover Greg Jackson's insanity in any form. As of January 2021, following the release of Onision in real life, Jackson's channels were suspended from the YouTube Partner Program indefinitely. The fact that it has taken this long is shocking, and flies in the face of other YouTubers who have been banned for way less. To describe Onision as anyone less than a monster who's criminally negligent to the best of times would be a disservice to his character. So, for posterity, let's recount the damage done by Onision before YouTube finally intervene and suspended his partnership. One last time. Starting his career on YouTube back in 2007, Greg Jackson managed to produce several videos that caught the attention of old tube. Similar to creators like Ryan Higa and Shane Dawson, Onision focused on edgy skit comedy before eventually branching out into reaction content and seemingly unscripted opinion videos. In 2009, he released the video, I'm a Banana, to viral success, the song becoming so popular that it even appeared on television on shows like Tosh.0. From here, his popularity and subscriber count exploded as many artists articles were written about him online. Although his skits were loud, juvenile, and politically incorrect by today's standards, Greg received little backlash for the content, outside of a few outliers poking fun at the actual drama he was involved in. Back in the day, his opinion content, and even more importantly his reactionary content, would land him in the most trouble. Whether it's calling all meat eaters murderers in a hyperbolic way, or just being generally mean and abrasive to both his fans, fellow content creator, and girlfriend, this earned him the title of YouTube's most troubled YouTuber. Over the course of the next decade, Onision would loudly broadcast his marital issues to his massive audience, even going as far as to weaponize them against people that just want nothing to do with it. Take Shiloh, who Greg targeted with videos, including one where he called alimony actual slavery because he had to financially support the ex who he convinced to quit her job in order to help make videos. Or Adrian Jorgensen, a girl Onision briefly dated before making public comments which violated her privacy and supported rape apologists. Greg argued that, since Adrian slept with more than 20 people before she was with me, she is a slut, and therefore cannot be raped. These comments would lead to Hank Green banning him from VidCon 2012. Hank Green, yes, that Hank Green, believed that despite how much he disagreed with Onision's content, that he had a right to express those beliefs. However, due to his horrible views, VidCon can't afford to protect him from possible violence, and his attitude would not contribute to a productive conversation, so he was barred. Onision's garbage attitude towards women would continue on through the decade despite the fact that he lost over 24,000 subscribers in the wake of that last controversy. On another channel of Greg's, Uh Oh Bro, which has since been retired, he would make a series of videos which featured pictures submitted by his audience. Mostly female fans, who were sometimes even underaged, would send pictures to Greg so that he could judge their bodies. As if watching a fully grown man rate teenage girls on their sex appeal wasn't gross enough, Greg would often make overly harsh and demeaning criticisms of the girls featured. Then go on to abuse the DMCA to silence anyone who looked too closely at his work. I want to take a second away from the video to acknowledge that all of this stuff I've talked about up until now, which is now bordering on a legal gray zone, has garnered next to no response from YouTube despite community members reporting and exposing Greg's content. To give context, Leafy is here lost his channel after only a few years for making fun of children and other content creators, while Onision has been doing this garbage for the better part of a decade. In addition to all of this, Onision was infamous for getting into public blowouts with other content creators in the name of attention-seeking. Whether we're talking about Mr. Epsion, Amazing Atheist, Smosh, or Elvis the Alien, nothing is worse than the statement he made in the wake of a tragedy involving a young content creator by the name of Christina Grimmie. Born in 1994, Grimmie began her YouTube career in 2009 by posting her covers of popular songs. After releasing her debut EP, Find Me, her YouTube channel reached 1 million subscribers. After she surpassed 2 million, Grimmie released her debut studio album, with Love in 2013. Grimmie then became a contestant on season 6 of The Voice, finishing in third place, which is insane. 18 years old and already that successful by just doing the YouTube dream. One mic, a room, and an audience waiting to discover you. On June 10th, 2016, Grimmie performed with Before You Exit at the Plaza Live in Orlando, Florida. After their performance ended at 10pm, Grimmie signed autographs inside the venue as part of the meet and greet. At 10.24pm, Grimmie was shot by someone who does not deserve to be named here. Grimmie had attempted 
to hug the shooter, but when she opened her arms, the deranged man opened fire before attempting to flee the scene. Christina's brother, Marcus Grimmy, apprehended the shooter, who broke from struggle and ended up shooting himself. This tragedy left behind two ultimately pointless and preventable deaths. One witness even complained that the security was more concerned about food and beverages being bought into the theater, yet had no metal detectors, nor did any security checks at the time, which could have caught the firearm early. The internet and mainstream community collectively came together and shared their love for Christina and her body of work. This was someone who contributed quite a bit to the early YouTube music industry, and by doing so much managed to connect to millions of people. Everyone from 21 Pilots to Reggie Phil's aim, I hope I pronounced that right, the head of Nintendo America at the time, had paid tribute, showing their love and support to a grieving family. So what could Onision say about this? A series of horrible takes where Greg blames the victim for being shot, chastises fans for mourning Christina's death by calling them fake, argues online with Marcus, who had fought his sister's killer, and ends it by admitting that he just loves being the center of attention, even if it's hate. People like this do not deserve to have a platform, and being a hope vampire like this that pretends to have all the answers but really just wants to watch the world burn are some of the most dangerous people, in my experience. This way, since 2018, sites that used to laud Onision as a rising star have been calling him worse than Logan Paul. In 2019, Onision was banned from Patreon for posting the phone number of a woman after she claimed she had been groomed and manipulated into a sexual relationship. The victim stated that she was sent texts asking her to be chained to the basement wall for a week with a sign around her neck that says, I'm sorry for lying. After the ban, as people began to investigate his activity, Onision uploaded a series of nonsensical videos with titles like, I'm sorry. In retrospect, this seems to have been a ploy to get Chris Hansen to make more content so that Greg could get more attention and make hundreds of thousands of views off of mental breakdowns. These would be monetized views, of course, thanks to his continued partnership with YouTube. In January 2021, following the release of Onision, In Real Life, a Discovery Channel documentary, Jackson's channels were suspended from the YouTube Partner Program. Now, it seems that his sole source of income is OnlyFans and direct donations. He still uploads occasionally to his channels, complaining about not getting paid anymore, but only to an audience of a couple thousand views each video. Even when Onision regularly made content in the form of skits or songs, the only thing people ever talked about was his controversial opinions and awful behavior. It appears this is how he will be remembered. Personally, I think Greg is a monster, and if left unchecked, will continue to use and abuse the people around him. I am disappointed that it took YouTube nearly a decade to actually enforce their own policies, considering Greg also regularly issues false DMCA takedowns and breaks YouTube's TOS in many other areas. I haven't even covered everything he's done, like the time when he tried to make a cult, or the various other allegations of abuse from both women he has been married to and those that claim to be groomed. The grooming situation is still an ongoing story, an investigation that might not have a happy ending. It's insane that it took an actual large corporation like Discovery to get YouTube to do anything about this. So, now it's time to say goodbye to Onision one last time. Since he makes no money and has given up on making real content, thanks to YouTube doing the right thing, way too late. The story of Pollution Entertainment is a case of the right thing being done far too late, like with many other items on our list. It wouldn't be until over a year after investigation by Chilean police before Matias Oriaro was removed from the YouTube platform. A deep run of animal abuse videos imitating and showing solidarity with their merciless killings had already infected video streaming platforms worldwide. The fact that Matias abuses pets is undisputed, but his cavalier attitude and threats to continue bringing harm to defenseless animals is what sparked outrage from the Spanish-speaking community, exposing the leaked video he himself filmed while beating his cat to death. Mantias began uploading to YouTube at a very young age to a channel called Pollution Entertainment. Pollution is a Spanish word meaning little plush, referring to the videos he initially posted of himself playing with plushies. Also posted to the channel were Five Nights at Freddy's Let's Plays, and amateur animations full of violence, high-pitched screaming, and crude depictions of blood and guts. Years later, Mantias would move on to making drama content about other young YouTubers, thus causing his channel to receive multiple strikes for bullying and almost losing his channel altogether. It was around this time that he admitted to frequently watching gore videos, as well as Mexican cartel atrocities, just for laughs. 
tensions began to mount between Pollution Entertainment and another YouTuber named Super Wario Man. A line was abruptly crossed when Montias sent Wario a series of videos on the Messenger app, WhatsApp. Montias had already broadcast red flags regarding the mistreatment of his cat, Jason Kruger. In one video, he restrains Jason before shoving an open can of cat food in his face, making the animal visibly uncomfortable and afraid. Later, Montias would reveal another video that Jason had to be put down due to injuries sustained in an accident. It wouldn't be until Wario leaked the videos Matthias has sent over WhatsApp to a website called his Fanchan that people would discover the truth. Hey, I'm the L man from the channel Banner. I co-write and edit many of these scripts with Creepy, including the one for the video you're watching now. While researching Pelochine Entertainment, I actually watched both of the videos he sent to Wario Man over WhatsApp. In the original script for this segment, I described the content of these videos in a level of detail, which Creepy and I later decided was too graphic for YouTube. Instead, we just want to get the point across that Matthias recorded himself crushing his cat, Jason Kruger, to death, then also doing terrible things to kittens he adopted for the express purpose of abusing. Thankfully, those kittens were rescued later, but I would still urge people not to look up these videos. Just don't go there. Matias would respond with damage control on Twitter, insisting that he did nothing wrong and that he did not abuse his pets. This only led to a more disturbing realization, as the 15-year-old generally had no remorse for what he'd done. In one tweet here accounts, I don't know who told you I'm regretful or sad about my cat's death. I don't give a f It's just barely a novelty, and that's it. I never did anything to him, and I regret nothing. The story has also caught the attention of local Chilean authorities, who decided not to arrest or prosecute Matias on the grounds that he was a minor, but only on the condition that he seek help. By 2019, outrage was beginning to die down, yet Matias still continued to post YouTube videos mistreating and threatening to mistreat animals. The Pollution Entertainment channel also became a source of inspiration to other animal abusers, who would go on to post videos hoping to gain the respect and attention Montias, whom they regularly regarded as a god. It wouldn't be until a year later that the inaction that led to this disturbing trend was given a spotlight thanks to the hashtag AnswerUsYouTube, with people asking why pollution entertainment can still exist, while community guidelines are interpreted so strangely with other channels. This spurred YouTube to take action, and finally banned pollution entertainment from the platform nearly two years too late. Even though the user has been removed, the content continues to be re-uploaded, and animal abusers continue to dedicate their sick activities to the channel, which has inspired them. We have covered a number of YouTubers on this list, many of whom would be considered irredeemable. But what if a person who needed to be stopped was also a force for good? Is it right to disregard injustice if the perpetrator was a good person doing the wrong things for the right reasons? How many good deeds would someone have to do to become exempt from that criticism? We believe that people who take a position of moral superiority over others are doubly responsible for holding themselves to a higher standard, else they risk losing their credibility and wasting their potential to do some actual good, myself included. Perhaps that's what makes the disastrous return of Chris Hansen so disappointing. His platform could have been used to educate actual parents and make a difference in cases where children were being put in danger. In retrospect, the efforts of Chris Hansen and the perverted justice team were tarnished from the start, with execution so sloppy that it allowed actual child predators to walk free instead of being brought to justice. For just a little bit of added context, my favorite show in the mid-2000s was To Catch a Predator, which captivated Dateline NBC audiences by using online decoys to lure child predators into an uncomfortable confrontation with the show's host, Chris Hansen. It's undeniably cathartic to see Chris call these people out, bring up their incriminating chat logs, and really make the predator squirm by reminding them that they had come to this house to do something illegal. Hansen's theatrics during these confrontations are largely what made the show so entertaining, but it wouldn't have been possible without the organization called Perverted Justice, who identified and lured these predators while working in concert with local law enforcement. To Catch a Predator had all the keys to success in this dedicated team, Dateline NBC's production crew, and Chris Hansen's dynamite hosting skills. 
This made audiences such as myself understandably excited when in 2015, Hansen himself announced a spiritual successor to To Catch a Predator in a series known as Hansen vs. Predator, which was fully funded on Kickstarter. Despite raising $89,000 of the $75,000 goal, only a few investigations were independently conducted on Hansen vs. Predator before the show was sold to Crime Watch Daily. In addition to this, supporters were not receiving their Kickstarter rewards that they had been promised, even rewards that, in theory, shouldn't require any shipping or effort on Chris Hansen's part. This raises the question, what happened to the $89,000? It turns out, Chris Hansen had been in outstanding debt, defaulting on payments on his Corvette convertible and losing his Stamford home to foreclosure. Writing checks that he figuratively and literally couldn't cash finally caught up to Chris in early 2019, when he was arrested for bounce checks totaling up to $13,000 to a mom and pop retailer he purchased his Kickstarter merchandise from. To this day, people are still waiting on their Hanson vs. Predator coffee mugs. Chris Hansen's brand would transition from disappointing to malicious after the advent of his YouTube channel in 2019, which would mark the beginning of its partnership with the website producer Vincent Nicotra. Remember Vince, because he will be very important later. The Chris Hansen channel began with a rocky start, uploading works he had found on YouTube already bearing his likeness, such as compilations of animated parodies and edited clips from To Catch a Predator and Hansen vs. Predator. Chris believed that since these videos contained his likeness and featured a show in which he was the host of but doesn't hold the legal copyright over, that it gave him ownership of all this content, which obviously, as you and I know, isn't true. One fan named Yap Yap became fed up with the empty promises and consistent stolen content and decided to copyright strike a video on Hansen's channel. The video in question had been lifted from Yap Yap's channel, an interview with Kenneth Fortin, which she had done some minor edits on. This copyright strike is obviously unjustified from our perspective, since neither party can truly claim ownership of this footage, and Yap Yap would even go on to retract the strike. But this wouldn't be enough to stop the complete fucking train wreck that was about to ensue, and the completely unjustifiable attack on other people's livelihoods. While it's unclear whether Chris Hansen's YouTube channel was being managed by a member of the Hansen vs. Predator team, Vince, or Chris himself, the channel would begin a series of false copyright strikes, exceedingly targeting critics. Four of Yap Yap's videos were struck in retaliation, including videos with footage owned by Dateline NBC and a meme video Yap Yap made to poke fun at the situation. Another example of a content creator struck in retaliation was The Cappening, who goes through a expensive and time-consuming process to retrieve footage from police interrogations, then heavily edits the footage, cleans up the audio, and makes it a bit more presentable. For example, The Cappening had a video taken down which was just footage of the Michael Manzi police interrogation, which had been stolen and re-uploaded onto the Chris Hansen channel, including a text summary of the investigation which The Cappening had written himself and was not credited for. Copyright strikes in Chris Hansen's name were also issued against anyone but Mr. GG who criticized Vince Hack performance as a web producer. By the way, Mr. GG did nothing wrong. He's an absolutely lovely content creator. I love his work. And really, Chris was just kind of trying to appeal to him because he thought he could get views or something out of him in a series of increasingly awkward live streams they did together. As if abusing YouTube's copyright system to silence critics by threatening their livelihood is pretty scummy, but at least you can kind of understand the mentality even if you don't agree with the actions. He also targeted channels that had no right to be targeted. People who hadn't uploaded to catch a predator content in years and had nothing to do with the current situation. Chris's team believed that they owned the very topic of to catch a predator, including everyone who's ever been on the show's entire life story which almost led to the deletion of Base Shaman's channel. My channel's in danger, you guys. It's in danger, and I don't know how much longer it'll be around. 
The thing is, like, you're wrong in what you're doing, Chris Hansen. And you even said, you said, we're doing this because someone did it to us. Okay, but it wasn't me. It wasn't these other folks you're getting their channels deleted. What's wrong with you, Chris Hansen? What's wrong with you, man? How much bitterness do you have in your heart to do this to people? This was me reading a Lorne, ma a Lorne poem, wearing my little Lorne mask, and you're trying to get my channel deleted for it. And the sad thing is, if my childhood wasn't already murdered enough, this isn't even the most abhorrent measures Chris Hansen's YouTube team would take against fellow content creators. If trying to take away someone's ability to pay rent for an opinion made several years ago on a topic that you don't own wasn't not only sad, but awful enough, yep yep, that person we mentioned before was doxed by the user official underscore HBP, who released information that could have been stolen from Yap Yap's subscription account to the Hansen vs Predator website. This was likely the work of web producer that we mentioned earlier, Vincent Nicotra, who set a precedent for resorting to such underhanded measures when he doxed Westmos in a YouTube comment reply, while also threatening him with legal action for daring to criticize him on the internet. Vincent would go on to dox two more TCAP community members with pictures on his Twitter account, adding to a laundry list of unprofessional behaviors. And I'm sorry I can't show a lot of this because I don't want to contribute to doxing people, but I will say this. Stay classy, Vince. Whether or not Chris Hansen was directly responsible for the fraudulent copyright strikes and releasing of private information, he chose not to act when the controversy was undoubtedly brought to his attention by his otherwise stagnant YouTube channel. Chris Hansen would later admit in interviews and tweets that he was aware of Vince's behavior and didn't see any issue with it. While Chris and Vince would tell you that the victims of predatory behavior are their absolute priority, it appears to take a backseat when playing the YouTube game poorly. This lack of accountability and attention-seeking behavior would go on to cause irreversible damage when Chris stumbled onto something big and kind of near and dear to my heart. Chris had found the ultimate walking scandal, someone who would surely resurrect his career from the ashes. And that someone was fellow YouTuber James Jackson, also known as Onision. After Onision made headlines due to accusations that he had abused young women and groomed the underage females that he interacted with online, Chris Hansen begun to investigate YouTube's most troubled star. This excited YouTube audiences who could easily rally against someone as blatantly evil and as awful as Jackson is, especially if it was behind someone like Chris Hansen who had a known history and penchant for putting predators behind bars. Hansen was even able to uncover a laptop containing bombshell evidence and receipts against Onision, which could have gone far to prove his intent to harm minors across state lines. Instead of immediately sending this case-defining evidence to proper authorities as quickly as humanly possible, Vince decided not to do that and hold on to the evidence, and instead decided to talk it up on social media teasing that they may have made a breakthrough. By dragging their feet this way, for those who don't understand the whole legal stuff, Chris Hansen broke something known as the chain of custody involving evidence and law enforcement. A key piece of evidence sat in either Chris's or Vince's office, collecting dust until it became inadmissible in court. Since nobody can prove that it wasn't tampered with anymore, this is going to be incredibly difficult to use in the case. In the wake of the controversy, Chris Hansen would finally fire Vincent Nicotra due to mounting backlash. But after multiple dox critics, multiple false copyright strikes, several deleted channels, and a botched participation in a criminal investigation involving the actual abuse of minors, the damage had already been done. While it's apparent that Chris Hansen's involvement in the Onision investigation did more harm than good, there is a case to be made that the tactics used on shows like To Catch a Predator and Hansen vs. Predator were sloppy from the beginning. These shows were produced for entertainment, prioritizing ratings over bringing actual predators to justice. In order to produce this show and get as many people to show up as possible to get as much footage to put on TV, the decoys used by perverted justice would often be the ones to bring up sex in these chat rooms meant to lure in predators. 
and would often be the ones to invite men to the house with the promise of sex. According to the law, one is entrapped when induced or persuaded by a law enforcement officers or their agents to commit a crime that had no previous intent to commit a crime. While I would make the argument that anyone that would show up at this house is clearly a bad and or evil person that needs to get some help, this was a problem for To Catch a Predator because the decoys often were the ones to initiate sexually explicit behavior, and by working in concert with law enforcement would meet the definition of an agent of law, persuading an individual to commit a crime. While To Catch a Predator resulted in many arrests, no less than 23 confirmed pedophiles have used the entrapment defense in order to walk free and continue to harm minors. There are cases which abuse to a child could have been prevented, but failed due to completely negligent behavior and sloppy execution. At the end of the day, Chris Hansen cheated all of us. He cheated on the Kickstarter backers who supported Hansen vs. Predator. He cheated the TCAP community by stealing their content and actively trying to take away their ability to feed themselves. He even cheated on his own wife. But most of all, Chris Hansen cheated on himself. I'm not gonna lie, I'm jealous of what Chris achieved, as it's something I personally dreamed of myself. A career in landing evil people behind bars while educating others about the dangers that they present. If he had surrounded himself with better people, opened himself up to criticism a little bit more, and dropped the ball a little less, maybe then he would still have a little bit of respect, credibility, and even my admiration. But instead, Chris Hansen, for some god unknown reason, is somehow on my list of worst YouTubers. Hey, looks like you made it to the end of yet another really long video. I would like to apologize for not uploading as much as I probably should be, and I'd also like to apologize for not having the Patreon end screen this time around. It will be included in the next video on the subject where I will be talking about Shane Dawson, as I was unable to include him in this video as I simply just kind of ran out of time. Either way, that segment is nearly halfway done, the script is done, it's all written, I just kind of got to put it together and all that jazz. I also want to let you guys know that this video wouldn't even be half as good if I didn't have the help that I did. Whether we're talking about Jay Moore and Your Friendly Gamer who really went to do the extra mile and make sure that I could get this edited on time, or at least what I did get edited on time. And then we also had Just Stop who helped me do with some of the writing and doing amazing voiceover, as well as Daft Pina who was able to pinch in on such short notice. I would like to thank all these people for making this video what it was as it's something that's kind of near and dear to my heart. I'm just hoping that this video in some way could help someone or do some good in the world. Probably not, but if it does, then it will do what I wanted it to do. I'm emotionally, physically, and mentally exhausted right now because I've been doing this hopped up on energy drinks for about the last week or so and living in probably the most unhealthy way I have in a long time. But hey, video's out and apparently if you made it here, it must have been good enough to watch. If you're at all interested in seeing more of what I like to do and seeing more music, then consider buying the album off of Bandcamp found linked below, or consider joining a patron and you get the album and any future music I make for free. If you're interested in using these songs in a commercial way, just send me an email or hit me up on Discord. I'm not too hard to reach. With that said, I'm exhausted, tired, and dead. And I just would like to wish you guys a pretty good day. I've been your host, that Creepy Reading, and once again, I'm gonna sign off and and maybe get a nap or two. Uh, have a good one.